We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Eleven Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Welcome on this Thursday night. It is a record-breaking week in Georgia as daily coronavirus cases keep climbing higher and higher. The governor says we don't need new restrictions. We just need people to take personal responsibility. This as he toured the state trying to get Georgians to wear masks. Today, Georgia recorded 3,472 new coronavirus cases. That's 500 more cases than yesterday. And these numbers are the highest that we have seen here in Georgia since the pandemic started. And even as the numbers climb, the president is touting better than expected job numbers. The unemployment rate falling to 11 percent. Today's announcement proves that our economy is roaring back. It's coming back extremely strong. Georgia's unemployment numbers are falling too, but we are hearing from people that their businesses are far from bouncing back completely. We will dig deeper into that in the minutes ahead. One of Metro Atlanta's biggest counties now grabbing attention by sending an emergency COVID-19 alert to cell phones. Joe Hinke spoke with the head of DeKalb County about why they're taking this new different action. As the number of new COVID-19 cases continues to rise, so does the demand for testing. You can see this very long line behind me here outside the South DeKalb Mall today with these folks waiting at least an hour to be tested. Now I'm told usually this line is long. Today though, it's even longer after DeKalb County took a unique action this morning to make sure people aren't forgetting about the pandemic. Cell phones around DeKalb County began ringing and buzzing this morning with what sounded like an Amber Alert, but it was actually DeKalb County asking people to wear a mask, social distance, stay home when possible, wash their hands often and get tested. Based on our research, this is the first time that any jurisdiction in the southeastern United States has used the emergency a warning system for this purpose. DeKalb CEO Michael Thurman says DeKalb County has the third highest number of COVID-19 cases in the state and he needed to grab people's attention as they prepare for July 4th gatherings. As of today, some 173 DeKalb County residents have fallen victim to this disease. They've lost their life. So I was just struggling to come up with a, a strategy or a resource where we could directly uh, remind and inform people to be careful, to follow the guidelines, and prevent the spread. Data as of 3 p.m. today shows COVID-19 cases are continuing to trend upward statewide, with a single day record being set today of nearly 3,500 cases. And DeKalb County cases also continue to add up, with the county setting its own single day record on Tuesday. Yesterday, uh, we hit a record 2,000 tests in a single day. Dr. Sandra Elizabeth Ford, director of the DeKalb County Board of Health, says cases and testing are both up, but the percentage of people testing positive is also rising. 
and she is seeing a spike in cases amongst people 30 and younger. They may not be utilizing masks as um, diligently as the rest of us, nor um, um, practicing social distancing. You know, we keep seeing these large crowds of young people, and it's really worrisome. Today, U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams was in Georgia getting a look at the area hardest hit by the virus, Gwinnett County. Three weeks ago, Gwinnett took over as the county with the most COVID cases in the state. The county tells us more testing plays a role, but the number of new cases far outpace the increase of tests. This is a week by week look at the cases, and they have been steadily rising with spikes starting the second week of June and continuing through the month. 16% of those cases are coming out of the Lawrenceville area and their zip code, they are reporting the county's highest numbers. We want everyone to understand that the Today, the U.S. Surgeon General joined Governor Kemp on that statewide tour, urging people to wear their masks. But Governor Kemp says Georgians don't need a mask mandate to do the right thing. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom says a citywide mandate is something she's considering. And 11 Live was the only local station to speak with Mayor Bottoms today about Georgia moving forward as the numbers climb. We'll hear a bit more from her later on in prime time. But right now, we want to hear from you. What's your perspective? We are asking you, should the state walk back reopening because of the rising COVID-19 cases? And should it go as far as another stay-at-home order? Almost 200 of you have already voted on our poll on 11alive.com slash vote. And you see the numbers uh, underneath us right now. It's 76% say yes, and 20% are 24% uh, are doing the thumbs down right now. We've been watching a few isolated showers that are still lingering out there tonight. We had a little better coverage of this with some showers that were over Metro Atlanta a little bit earlier. Those have faded out, but now what's left is we have some showers over on the west side and a few showers up in parts of northeast Georgia that uh, did have a little bit of thunder and lightning with them and a couple of pockets of heavy rain. Let's check out this one here on the west side of Atlanta. You can see inside the perimeter we are fine right now, but these showers are just to the south of Dallas uh, right there in the southern parts of, Spal of Paulding County and a little bit of light Light rain right there moving in closer to Villa Rica, the northern parts of Carroll County, and right there in the northwestern parts of Douglas County, just north of I-20, just a couple little showers there. This had some lightning with it earlier. Now we're not detecting any lightning out of that. Back up in northeast Georgia right now, we have a few additional showers here. This one between Helen and Cleveland and Mossy Creek, where we've got some uh, moderate rain there. Also back into near Suchus in the part northern parts of Lumpkin County and the southern parts of Union County here. And then a few other showers up in Raven County. But again, nothing really too strong. They're basically going to be fading themselves out. We had some thunder and lightning with those a little bit earlier, but they're diminishing as they move down toward the south. We're going to see mainly mostly dry conditions for the rest of the nighttime hours, but then tomorrow another chance for a few scattered showers to redevelop. Let's take a live look out there right now. The sun goes down at 852 tonight. This is a live look from our tower cam uh, at uh, SunTrust Park there uh, looking over the park and you can see the sun there to the west and then on the left hand side of your screen, some of those clouds in association with those few light showers that are still over to the west. Stay with us. We'll let you know more about if these rain chances are going to linger into your holiday weekend. We have more on that coming up. All right, Chris, that's what everybody wants to know. Meanwhile, the upcoming 4th of July weekend gives families a chance to get away even during this pandemic. But Airbnb is taking aggressive action, making sure guests are as safe as they can be. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez explains. The development was not a response to the pandemic. I'd say the decision to really share it out widely today was. Airbnb is implementing a new policy to crack down on unauthorized parties. It's not just like a policy in name only. We, we literally are going to block that reservation. The platform is banning users under the age of 25 with no track record of positive reviews from renting an entire house in their area. Anything that we can do to limit the ability for, for someone to organize a gathering along those lines, we're going to do it. It comes just as folks are gearing up for the 4th of July weekend, while we are continuing to see record COVID-19 cases here in Georgia. Dr. Sharag Patel, Population Health Medical Director at Wellstar, says if you are planning on taking a trip, make sure it's somewhere you can adhere to CDC's guidelines. Going to the mountains, going to a lake house that's more desolate, I think it's going to be much safer than hitting the big city, the club, or the beach. Mountains are top of mind for those wanting to venture out this weekend. Airbnb says searches for listings in Blue Ridge Mountains 
are up by nearly 15% compared to this time last year. People want to travel, but they don't necessarily want to get on a plane. They want to be able to travel like within a tank of gas is sort of what we're seeing. Airbnb says it also has enhanced the cleaning protocols during the pandemic to keep both hosts and guests safe during this time. As the daily case numbers of COVID cases rise, Georgia's economy is bouncing back. The state saw some of the largest decreases in first time unemployment claims last week, falling by more than 9,900, according to the U.S. Labor Department. Jobless rates are still far above what they were at the beginning of the year, and for some that is a mixed bag. As 11 Alive's Doug Richards explains, for those returning to work, it's not always back to business as usual. This DeKalb County hair salon reopened in May after Governor Kemp lifted restrictions on hair salons and other businesses. But the reopening here has been uneven at best. This business is being open for 26 years, Little Scissors. Go to a salon called Little Scissors and you'll see too many empty chairs and too many hairstylists just waiting. 25 years career. Yep, the, this is the worst ever since the shop opened. We got time to chill, a lot of time like that. Statistically, they are among those Georgians who have gone back to work. But Lee Chow says she and her co-workers are earning only about 20% of the money they'd made before the pandemic started. I cannot see any good news coming in. It's been worse for Jacob Deaton, a professional guitarist and music entrepreneur. With live music effectively shut down, so has most of Deaton's income. I would say this has kind of been sort of a dream. You know, like I, I like not in a good way. Like I kind of feel like it's like maybe a, more of a nightmare uh, that I keep waking up every day and I keep thinking that it's going to be over. And then here we are again. Deaton says he's making a bit of money giving online music lessons and doing virtual performances. The steady income now is his unemployment check. It's just kind of out of another world. I don't feel like I'm in the world that I know, you know. And the workers we talked with say that the long-term outlook looks pretty dark, particularly with COVID-19 rates rising again in Georgia. And we continue to hear from people having problems collecting unemployment. To read about some of the common issues and some solutions, you can go to 11alive.com. Well, let's catch you up on some other local headlines tonight. Police say they have arrested the man responsible for killing 71-year-old Kate Thomason. She was found dead in her Sandy Springs home in June of 2018. And just after the two year anniversary of her death, police and U.S. Marshals tracked down 24 year old James Christopher mm. Jones in Decatur. He faces multiple charges, including murder and burglary. And with this arrest, Sandy Springs says it only has one outstanding unsolved murder dating back to 2006. Police have released the name of a suspect after a gunfight ended with several bystanders hurt, including a 10 year old girl. DeKalb County Police say Arthur Brown started the shootout last night at the Haven Motel on Memorial Drive. Brown was shot in the stomach and is now in the hospital, and he is also facing charges. Two adults and the 10 year olds were also hit, but they are all expected to survive. The main security checkpoint at Hartsfield Jackson has reopened today. This after a TSA agent tested positive for COVID-19. The airport closed most of a uh, closed the services there for most of the day yesterday for deep cleaning. <clears throat> Officials say the employee last worked at the checkpoint Tuesday from 3.30 a.m. until noon. All TSA employees who work that same shift have been asked to quarantine for 14 days. Coming up, a family says their teenager was killed over $10. He was out selling water bottles not far from Georgia Tech, and tonight they are out in the community speaking against teen gun violence. And don't forget, we are streaming right now live on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive News primetime after the break. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 family now working to raise awareness about teen gun violence after they say an 18 year old was shot and killed during a fight with another teen all over $10. This is a horrific tragedy and the story shocking everyone who has seen it, heard about it, thinking about it. Thousands of you expressing your condolences on our Facebook page. Here's Latasha Givens with more. I'm sorry, this is your hard to see. Man, my brother just got shot. We need an ambulance. And he not moving, but he just laying on the ground, bro. This is part of the 911 call released by police made moments after 18-year-old Jelani Pless was shot and killed last Saturday in Midtown while selling bottled water. Jelani's friend told his family he and another teen selling water got into a fight over a $10 bill a customer gave to Jelani instead of him. Thursday, Jelani's family, along with activists, returned to the area to raise awareness about teens and gun violence. Tamika Pless, Jelani's mother, was too emotional to talk, but his little sister, Makira Brown, shared the agony over losing her big brother. She also has a message for the juvenile police have issued an arrest warrant for. It's hard losing your best friend. It's hard losing the closest thing to you, your, your protector, your brother, the closest thing to you. You only three years younger than me. Please just turn yourself in. So when I heard about this murder, man, it just really just, it just set me off a little bit. Keith so Lewis, founder of I'm a Father First, sponsors the Corner Boys to help organize teens who want to sell water during the summer. He says the group pays a flat $50 to each teen, regardless of how much they sell, so they don't have to fight over territory or become too aggressive when approaching customers. Stephen Moore, Jelani's uncle, wants the city to provide more programs to Atlanta teens. Instead of being out here on the corner, you know, having territorial fights and killing and shooting each other over a buck or a dollar, it's just senseless, man. GBI records don't track the number of teens over 18 who die from gun violence, but officials say based on current cases, the number of children up to the age of 17 dying due to gun violence is trending higher in 2020 than this time last year. This is based on preliminary data. According to GBI records, at least 21 children have died from gun violence in Georgia this year. The youngest victim, only five. At least 13 of the victims have been African Americans. We're still tracking just a few isolated showers out there right now. Nothing really going on in the city of Atlanta. But if you look over to the west, out I-20, over in the southern parts of uh, Paulding County, you've got a shower there. Also up in north Georgia, in areas of Lumpkin County, also into White County, we have some showers in Raven County. We're going to take a closer look at those. And you can see here how they're moving. These are generally drifting down toward the south, pushing a little bit toward the southwest. This one is also moving toward the south and west over into Paulding County. We're fine here in Atlanta right now, even though we had a few showers that came through a little bit earlier, but this is all that's left of that cell that's just to the south of Dallas. Some moderate little pockets of heavy rain, some light stuff just north of I-20 near Villa Rica, and then a few more of these showers up in northeast Georgia. This one up in Rabin County, that's to the west of Clayton, has some moderate rain with it. We have some moderate rain here just south of Helen, also over towards Suchess, the northern parts of Lumpkin County, and the southern parts of Union County is where we have some of those uh, lighter to moderate showers, and we do think those are going to be fading out a little while. They had a little bit of lightning with them earlier in northeast Georgia, but now that is all falling apart. And that's going to be the trend for the rest of the evening hours as we're losing some of the heating of the day. Any of these showers will fall apart. We won't see really many additional showers that are going to be redeveloping. Here's a live look. This is at the Gwinnett County Chamber of Commerce as we're looking toward the west here from Sugarloaf Car Parkway. And the sun will be going down at 852, so it's getting closer to the horizon. 
Mixing in with just a few of those clouds in Gwinnett, but those Gwinnett County clouds are not causing any rain. Uh, fewer clouds up in Rome in northwest Georgia. We have a little better view of the sun nearing the horizon. There are a few clouds on the horizon, though, that might block out the sun as it kind of dips below the horizon again coming up uh, just before 9 o'clock tonight. Let me show you what we're watching with the temperatures around North Georgia, and we had a little bit of a range of temperatures early on with highs today that made it up into the upper 80s at 89 degrees, and then we had a little bit of rain come in that dropped us down into the lower 80s. Now we're back to 83 here. Athens, you're still at 90 here in the 8 o'clock hour. Duluth is 87, 83 in Marietta, still 90 also in Rome. But we did have some rain-cooled air that brought some folks down, like in uh, Covington, it's 81 now. They were in the 70s just a little bit earlier. Tomorrow, we're going to go with the 7 on the wasometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Highs near 91 degrees. It's going to be warm, warmer than it was today. And then about a 30% chance for some of those scattered showers that we're going to see around in the area. Take a look at what we're watching tonight. As we mentioned, losing the heating of the day. We'll see any of those showers falling apart that are still out there. Tomorrow morning we start off dry and at lunchtime we'll still be dry too. It's in the afternoon hours when we see just a few of those scattered showers that'll pop up. Rain chance at about 30%. Those die out in the evening and then it's the same drill on Saturday too. We are going to see those scattered showers developing around lunchtime and after. We're going to stick with about a 30% chance for a shower on Saturday uh, on the 4th of July. So it's not a washout. There will be plenty of dry hours around. I just want you to be aware that in the afternoon hours, just be prepared. You might have to run for cover if one of those showers bubbles up over you. So tomorrow's highs will be near 91 degrees, and then we are going to be at 91 again on Saturday. Both days we'll see a 30% chance for some of those scattered showers. That rain chance will stick with us as well on Sunday, and then the rain chances go up a little bit more as we head toward the, uh, the work week next week. 40% chance Monday, 50% chance Tuesday and Wednesday, and then back to 40% chance on Thursday. And as those rain chances come up a little bit, the temperatures will come down a little bit back into the 80s. Well, we all know that sound, but have you heard it recently in your neighborhood? It's not even the 4th of July yet. We're still days away, and authorities say more fireworks have been going off. It's been happening all hours of the night for weeks now. Some say it's COVID boredom and others think it might just go on well after the 4th of July holiday. But whatever the reason, these fireworks have a lot of you talking. Mary Jo says it's obvious why fireworks are so popular. There's nothing else to do. She thinks there is going to be a lot more this year than in the past. She says you shouldn't play it on sleeping. Sarah, on the other hand, is not happy about the noise. She says fireworks should be banned in and near residential areas or that the silent kind <coughs> should be mandated. NKR says, hey, maybe people are just celebrating that we are halfway through 2020. I think that's a reason a lot of folks think uh, we maybe should celebrate. So tonight on Up Late at 11 on our sister station, 11 Alive, we're going to talk with the pros to find out what's up with this wave of fireworks. And while you wait, you can head on over to the comment section of our 11 Live Facebook page and let us know what you think. We'll be right back. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. 
Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Coronavirus is forcing people to change their 4th of July traditions, but even with the HIC Peachtree Road Race pushed back to Thanksgiving, one man who has run the race every single year for 50 years has found a way to keep the spirit alive. Caitlin Ross caught up with an amazing man today. The AJC Peachtree Road Race won't look like this for Bill Thorne this year, or like this, but that's okay by him. Well, I'm going to run. In fact, I just got through in Tyrone marking off a, a, a 10K course. He's invited anyone who wants to join him to run their own peach tree Saturday morning at 7 a.m. If you would like to... Uh experience a 6.2 or however far you want to run and you want to go when I go meet me at seven o'clock in front of my mailbox. The 89 year old works out 365 days a year and has run the peach tree every single year since he was 39 years old. If it counted on Saturday I would be 89 but when we have it this year which is Thanksgiving day I will be 90. I'll be 90 in September. And that means if I can keep going the next year, I'll also be 90. He's one of only 110 people who finished the original Peachtree race in 1970. Just like the first year, you didn't get a T-shirt. So you couldn't be running for a T-shirt. He's kept every shirt from every year since. But it's not about the T-shirt for Bill or even the big crowds. It's about consistency and commitment. Peach tree is just something he refuses to miss. Never. I plan around it. That's just like anything. I make it a priority. That is amazing. That is unbelievable. And don't forget the AJC Peach Tree Road Race is going virtual. We got you covered on all of that as we look forward to what is going to be a very, very interesting period. Certainly, Thanksgiving Day will be. Uh, uh, a new event, a new time in all of our lives. That's all on 11alive.com. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, 
and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects. Thank you for joining us today, Mayor. We have a number of questions we want to get to with you. And I want to start with the big mask debate. So right now, the city of Savannah is the only Georgia city with a mask requirement. Do you plan to issue a mask mandate for the city of Atlanta? Well, it's something that we are in discussions about. And what I know is this, that with or without um, a, something mandating that people wear masks, people should still wear masks. Mm -hmm. And it is really the most unselfish thing that you can do as it relates to COVID-19 that not only protects yourself, um, but the people around you. And when I'm looking at numbers of COVID-19 that are very alarming, um, I haven't seen numbers this high in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And this is something that people should take seriously. And so we'll continue to watch what happens mm -hmm. in Savannah and then make our decisions accordingly. Is it something you are thinking about? It is something I am thinking about, yes. Okay. Um, I saw your tweet the other day. You said that you're a realist and not an alarmist, but we have never seen numbers like this before since the pandemic in Georgia. Yeah, it's, it's very concerning. And I receive a daily update from our team and it shows um, the seven day period data and how high the numbers are ticking up. And there was a point in time when our numbers had gotten down as low as 8% um, over a week's time. They're now over 20%. And so I, I think, again, we have to take responsibility for ourselves, but also think about the people who are around us who are vulnerable. We know that COVID-19 is making healthy people very, very sick. But also think about our children and think about our seniors and people with compromised immune systems and even people with underlying health conditions, and these are very common conditions in our city, asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes, a lot of people don't even know that they suffer from these things, but if they are infected with COVID-19, it could prove deadly. Do you think the governor should mandate everyone wear masks? I think it would be helpful if we had some consistency throughout the state, but the reality is this, even with a mandate, um, if people don't take it seriously, then it, it's going to be very difficult for us to enforce. But I do think any type of consistent messaging that we can have coming from the governor's office is helpful. I'm very encouraged that he's going around the state encouraging people to wear a mask. And, and we'll see if it's um, helpful in Savannah in terms of um, their, their numbers and rate of infection and whether it's enforceable as well. So we saw the governor out with the U.S. Surgeon General today putting that message out for everyone to wear masks. What do you think is to blame for the surge of infections here in Georgia? Well, my understanding in talking with our healthcare professionals, they're a combination of things. One, the reopening certainly did not help us with our numbers. And then we had so many um, mass gatherings over the past few weeks. And so I, I think it has, has been um, a, a perfect, um, unfortunate storm in terms of opening up suddenly and then adding on top of that mass gatherings. Um, and so I think, I, I don't know that the experts know definitively um, which caused what, but what we do know is where we are today and our infection rates um, are going through the roof. 
Do you think we opened up too fast? I do. I, I've always said that I, I thought we needed to be a, a little more thoughtful in terms of how we reopen and that it should have been a much more phased approach and also an opportunity for us to do more contact tracing. When we look at where the numbers are lower in the country, it is in the Northeast where they were a bit slower to reopen. But um, we are where we are now. We have to deal with what's in front of us today. And what's in front of us is that we have numbers that are that are going up by the day. And we just have to continue um, to be vigilant. Yeah. And again, it's hot. So people don't want to wear masks outside. That's understandable. But if that's the case and you have the opportunity to stay inside, then we just encourage people to do that as well. So you mentioned the Northeast. I'm from the Northeast. And uh, just earlier this week, states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut mandated that uh, if Georgians come to those states, they have to quarantine. It's a mandatory quarantine for 14 days if they choose to visit. Do you agree with states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, making this mandate on Georgians if they want to come visit? I certainly understand because they um, have worked very hard to try and manage the outbreaks in their states. Yeah. And so it's, it's understandable that they want to continue to do what they need to do to protect the residents uh, within, within their states. And I just wish that we had been a, a, a bit more thoughtful in terms of how we reopen, not just in Georgia, but really throughout the Southeast. And when you look at where our numbers are, are ticking up, they are in states that open up very early. And um, again, the, it, we can Monday morning quarterback, but for us to make a difference now, we've got to look at where we are and, and look, at, look ahead. And a huge part of that, again, is avoiding mass gatherings and wearing a mask when you are out in public and, and keeping your distance. What do you say to anyone thinking about attending a big July 4th celebration or fireworks celebration this weekend? Just keep your distance. Stay six feet apart and wear a mask. It, it's not complicated. And, and if you can't do that, then just stay home. So let's turn now to morale within the Atlanta Police Department. The foundation president says morale has plummeted to an all-time low following a turbulent two weeks that we saw toward the end of May and the beginning of June. Eight officers now facing criminal charges. Five have lost their jobs. Officers say they don't feel valued. Is there anything, Mayor, that you've been able to say or do recently to boost morale and make these officers feel valued? And also, do you think that's your responsibility now? Well, I think it's unfortunate that our officers feel that way, but I think it's not just in Atlanta. I think that's happening across the country, and it has. this has been trending this way for a very long time. But that being said, I understand that our officers have concerns um, about going out on the streets and, and not just the way that they feel that the public um, is treating them, but certainly um, their response to my response to what's happened in the city. That being said, I've always been committed to public safety in our city, as and especially to our police officers. Um, during the first uh, couple of years of, in office, I put in place a 30% pay increase for our police officers, which was the largest in the history of the city. And I don't say that um, simply to mention the monetary part of it, because that money doesn't make somebody always feel value. But but to remind our officers that when I didn't have the support of any police unions in the city, I still did what I thought was the right thing to do because I believe that they deserve to be paid and I believe they deserve to have the opportunity to live in it, be able to live in our city, afford to live in our city and not have to work two to three jobs. So in the same way that I made that commitment to our officers, I just ask that they be reminded of the commitment that they made to our city when they took their oath. Nobody said that this job would be easy. It's not easy being mayor, certainly not easy being a police officer, but there's a commitment that comes with that. There will be bumps in the road. There have been bumps in the road. We are mindful of that, 
Um, but the changes that we are making, not just for the safety of our community, but for the safety of our officers as well. And I think we'll get to the other side of this, but I think in the same way our demonstrators have to express themselves, um, I think that our officers are taking the opportunity to do that as well. So do you think there's anything extra that you would, you would need to do during this unprecedented time to show those officers that they're valued? Is there anything extra that needs to happen? I think that we need to be very clear on what our expectations are and to the extent that we have failed our officers in any way with the training that we are providing our officers. I think it is our responsibility as a city to make it very clear what our rules and regulations are, what our expectations are. So we've done that with a series of uh, things that have come out of the advisory committee. We are looking forward to getting input from our officers. And one of our student activists uh, said something that I, I thought was so very important. He said, this cannot be a we versus uh, an us versus them conversation. It has to be a we conversation. And I think part of that we conversation is making sure that our police officers are at the table and, and are able to share their thoughts and concerns um, about how we transform policing in our city. Well, you are a contender to be Joe, Bi Joe Biden's vice president. Do you want the job? You know, I want Joe Biden to make the best choice that's going to help him defeat Donald Trump. And so if my name is, is called, that's a conversation I'll have at that time, but I don't get too high, I don't get too low, and I don't get too far ahead. I, I look at what's in front of me, and what's in front of me right now is making sure our city is where it needs to be. Do you think it's important for Joe Biden to select a woman of color? I think it's important for him to select the person who's going to help him win, and then help him govern, because I... Every, everything about America has changed. Yeah. Um, there were so many problems that we knew existed in our country and that we were focused on, but certainly not in the way that we've been focused over the past several weeks. And I think if you talk with anyone who went through the civil rights movement, they will even say that this mobilization across the globe is even different than that movement just in terms of the scale. So mm -hmm. I think that Joe Biden should have whomever by his side he believes can help him lead our country through this. All right, Mayor, I appreciate your time. I wish I could hug you in person. And I wish in I person. <laughs> Right before the unrest, things were getting a little, you know, a little easier, in which I thought maybe I could see you in person for this interview, but I appreciate your time nevertheless. So nice to see you always. For at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We're still tracking just a few isolated showers that are out there tonight. Not many of them around, but just a few of them and nothing here in Atlanta. We've been watching some of these and we had some around Atlanta earlier and then some on the west side. These had some thunder and lightning coming out of Cobb County into Douglas County and southern parts of Paulding County. That's all falling apart right now. Over to the east of us, we have a shower here uh, that's over in Walton County that is really just developing here just to the west of Monroe, north of Jersey, mainly light. There's a little bit of moderate rain with this. We're going to keep an eye on this since it's just developing to see if it kicks up any more showers. And then also in North Georgia, these showers have been holding together for a little while near Helen, also in the western parts of Rabin County, right there on the Towns County line, and also into parts of Lumpkin County, southern parts of Union County as well, near such as some light to moderate showers and that's pretty much all that we have out there right now and now that we are losing the heating of the day uh, these showers are going to be diminishing and I don't think we'll see many other ones developing out there tonight here's a live look in Rome as we're looking toward the west at the sun going down it sets at uh, 852 tonight so it's nearing the horizon kind of behind those clouds there on the horizon but some nice color as well as in Rome and uh, Noonan we're also looking toward the west the sun is behind these trees so you can't really see it uh, right there on the horizon but still kind of of lighting up some of those clouds that are out there to give us a little bit of color with that as well. Here's a look at what we've been watching today. It got warm, 89 degrees. Our low this morning was 71. And look how that matches exactly with the averages for today's date. We should be around 89 at this time of year for a high and should have a low around 71 at this time of year for a low. So these temperatures today that we had were exactly what we should be here for the second day of July. Now, uh, Hartsfield Jackson reported no precip today, even though there were some showers nearby that dropped the temperature there, but they didn't get anything officially in the rain bucket there. So our surplus is at 1326. Take a look at these temperatures that we had out there today. It was that mild start in the low 70s, and then we started to watch those temperatures rise. We actually got up to 89 degrees in between these hourlies, and then when we had a few showers nearby Hartsfield, that's when those temperatures dropped briefly into the upper 70s, and then that rain moved out out so quickly and moved away so quickly and the sun returned, it actually started warming up again to 84 at 7 o'clock, now back to uh, 83 and 82 degrees at the 8 o'clock hour. Temperatures right now, we're at 83 here in town, 82 in Carrollton. Athens, you're still at 90, really warm there. And with those showers near Covington, it's dropped into the 70s at 79 degrees. Canton also at 79, but Rome is at 90. So it all depends on who got rain as to just how warm it got today and how long those temperatures have been holding uh, very warm. So uh, in the morning, it's going to be a really warm, mild start in the 70s. By 9, we'll be up to 77. Upper 80s here in the afternoon. I really think we're going to get into the low 90s for a high in between these hourlies and then into the 80s during the evening hours tomorrow. But you're not really seeing much in the form of rain on here. I am going with a 30% chance for an isolated shower to pop up tomorrow, but it's not going to be widespread. There will be a lot of dry hours around. So here's that high of 91 on our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. I'm going to go with the 7. So tonight, as you've been seeing here, only those few little isolated showers, they're falling apart. 
tonight, so no more issues with any rain around. It's going to be a really nice morning, even though it's going to be mild. We'll have some sunshine at lunchtime. It is still dry, and then in the afternoon, not a widespread coverage of rain, just about a 30% chance for some of those scattered showers to move through, and we'll pretty much do the same thing on Saturday with a mild start with dry conditions. Then in the afternoon, a few of those pop up showers developing and on Sunday, very similar highs in the lower 90s with a 30% chance for showers. We are bringing up the rain chances uh, for next week to 40% Monday, 50% chance on Tuesday and Wednesday, and then back to a 40% chance Thursday. And since the rain chances are going to be a little bit higher with a little more cloud cover, the temperatures will come back down into the 80s. All right, Chris, thank you. Well, the College Football Hall of Fame is open once again and features a new exhibit that honors historically black colleges and universities. What they couldn't have predicted is how it would resonate after protests over social injustice reached their doors just last month. Hall of Fame CEO Kimberly Bowden gives us a sneak peek inside. It was amazing to see the volunteers, the amount of volunteers that came down. All, all races, all genders, families, couples, individuals. This guy came with his dogs and, you know, they brought trash bags and brooms and water bottles and said, tell us what to do. We've been closed for three and a half months. We closed on March 16th. Just having our doors open is a win. Arnett Ace Mumford was a coaching legend at four historically black universities. From In light of the conversations that are going on right now, in light of, of all the, the movement and, and, and the action that's being taken. We wanted to celebrate the positive. We wanted to celebrate something that's, that has meant so much to so many people and just really make it shine. And what a perfect time, time to do that when we open and kind of put that out there and put that in the forefront. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, 
the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you, first responders. Prayer, support, and compassion at hospitals these days, those are the qualities needed from chaplains like the one you're about to meet. He might not be the first person you think of when you think of a hospital, but Brian Quinn plays a critical role at this and in this. Here's Matt Pearl. <laughs> I don't know how you're all feeling about this. I'm sure you come with lots of different emotions. But what you do is very close to the heart of God. My name is Brian Quinn, and I've been doing a, this chaplaincy work for 34 years at Medical City, Dallas. Just before all of this happened, I had weddings organized and other things organized, and then this happens. Uh, someone leadership asked me, are you guys coming in? I said, absolutely, we're coming in. I think we, we sometimes forget um, how lonely a patient can be in this hour of crisis. We're in this together. We're in it together. A burden for me, for hospital staff, has been this thing called compassion fatigue. When you go home at nights and you feel you have nothing left to give and you start to question why, trying to remind the staff that they need to take care of themselves because an unbalanced wheel will wear out the quickest. Working 12 hours in a COVID unit, the stress, the tension, the fears, the feelings, and to see their courage and compassion in light of the storm is, has been quite remarkable. I confess to you it's a choice that as caregivers and as chaplains, we have to choose every day. Uh, we have to choose hope. We may have been called in the night before to work a death, but we have to choose that day, hope, because hope is an amazing thing. I couldn't do this if I didn't have the hope that there is always something better to come. God is still in the throne. His promise is true. He will not forget you. Still ahead on prime time, face coverings put to the test. Our team verifies whether face shields are as effective as masks after a woman says a store would not let her enter. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. 
We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Atlanta's mayor is pushing everyone to complete the 2020 census and as the final deadline approaches, volunteers have started reaching out to colleges, senior living facilities and other places where people live in large groups to make sure everyone is counted. Next month, they will begin to focus on individual homes. So far, about 61% of Americans have sent back their census response. In Georgia, we're below that, sitting at almost 58%. Mayor Bottom says Atlanta's response rate is better than in 2010, but she wants as many people as possible to respond to make sure they are counted in some of our state's most important decisions. It's how we get money into our state and into our city. It's how we get money for our schools, our hospitals, our infrastructure. Everybody wants better roads, and it's how we get um, representation in Congress. As well, it even determines how our council, city council district lines will be drawn. Well, not only is it a big decision making tool, the census can also be very personal. For Mayor Bottoms, it helps her keep records of her family history. This is a copy of the 1870 census. My grandmother's grandfather, a freed slave, is listed on this census. His name was Shepherd Peak, mm -hmm. and he was from Crawfordsville, Georgia. This is his picture here. And so I am um, reminded of so many things during this time, just about the, the struggles and challenges um, that my ancestors overcame. But to see him reflected on the census seven years after the Emancipation Proclamation, I think really speaks to this responsibility that we all have. And when I see that he took the time to be a part of the census in the midst of all that was happening um, <clears throat> in his world, then certainly we can all take time to do the same. Certainly an incredible story for her family there. Mayor Bottoms talks about a lot of things from the state's response to coronavirus to school in the fall. You heard some of that at the top of this last half hour. You can watch Sheba Russell's full interview with Mayor Bottoms right now on our 11 Alive YouTube page. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. An alarming trend. Today, Georgia once again broke a single day record for COVID-19 cases, adding more than 3,400 new cases since yesterday. Coronavirus cases are rising in 40 out of 50 U.S. states, and that's according to data from the COVID tracking project. With the infection curve heading in the wrong direction, many states are cracking down on opening back up. More than 1,400 doctors in Georgia have come together to urge the governor to make masks mandatory. Yeah, that's right, Natisha. Today they sent a letter warning of a critical shortage of hospital beds if the state does not act now. And investigator Rebecca Lynchdom spoke with one of the doctors about their concerns. The doctors who wrote this letter want the governor to close down bars and nightclubs, prohibit the number of people at gatherings to 25, including at church, and they want local leaders to have authority to make the rules residents follow. To close down when they need to close down, to mandate masks, even though the governor is not willing to mandate masks. It could make a huge difference. To get a sense for how this virus is now impacting our community, we're breaking down the pandemic into two phases, basically cutting the plateau period in half. Phase one is the date of our first COVID-related death in March to May 14th. Phase two goes from May 15th to today. Even though our current phase has fewer days, we already have more COVID cases. Some of that is due to testing. We've conducted nearly 384,000 more tests than in the first part of the pandemic. Dr. Thompson says studies show those cases 
are coming from super spreader events. Think Memorial Day, large social gatherings in those family get togethers where we kind of let our guard down. The fact more young people are getting infected in this round is little comfort for doctors. It's not going to stay there. We have much more virus circulating in the community than we had before we began the shelter in place order. So far, more people were hospitalized in phase one. On average, each day, 25 people were admitted to the ICU. In phase two, that average is lower, 18 a day. But since our cases didn't start to swell until Saturday, Dr. Thompson believes next week, that number will change significantly. It's not about scaring people. Panic doesn't help. Scaring people doesn't help. But knowledge is power. And we have to emphasize the fact that, that Georgia is now growing out of control in terms of this pandemic. Right now, there are 1,649 people receiving care for COVID-19 in the hospital. That is more than any day since GMO started reporting this data on May 1st. And, you know, among those hospitalized right now is former GOP presidential hopeful and Atlanta resident Herman Cain. A statement posted to his Twitter account says that he tested positive for coronavirus Monday. And by Wednesday, his symptoms were serious enough that he had to be hospitalized. The 74-year-old is resting comfort comfortably uh, in an Atlanta hospital tonight and does not require a ventilator. The tweet also says there's no way to know for sure how and when he contracted the virus. But several people are now pointing to Kane's attendance to President Donald Trump's rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma on June 20th. The conservative radio host and vocal Trump supporter posted photographs from the event, mask free and sitting in the crowd. He also tweeted a reminder just yesterday that face coverings were not required for the president's Independence Day celebration at Mount Rushmore. Well, down in Texas, Texas uh, Governor Greg Abbott ordering everyone to wear a face covering in public in any county that had 20 or more positive coronavirus cases. He previously refused to require masks, even undercutting efforts by local governments to do so. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp is also reluctant to mandate mask use. That led Savannah's mayor to issue his own requirement this week, even though the governor has said in the past that city policies cannot be stricter than the state's. Now, some Atlanta city leaders say they're ready to follow Savannah's lead. Maybe we need to join their fight as well. So if he has to go after Savannah, he has to go after a whole lot of us at the same time. That may be a strategy. In an exclusive interview with Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, we asked her thoughts on a mask mandate for the city. She says it's something they're discussing, calling mask wearing the most unselfish thing we can do. It not only protects yourself, um, but the people around you. And when I'm looking at numbers of COVID-19 that are very alarming, um, I haven't seen numbers this high in a very long time. And this is something that people should take seriously. And so we'll continue to watch what happens mm -hmm. in Savannah and then make our decision. And of course, we're going to have a lot more with the mayor later in prime time. Now, with cases on the rise, DeKalb County took a very unique step today to alert people ahead of the holiday weekend. Joe Hinkey explains. Seeing long lines for COVID-19 testing, that is not new. This line outside the South DeKalb Mall, though, is longer than usual. After DeKalb County took a unique action this morning and made cell phones across the county start buzzing with a public safety alert. This alert message hit cell phones across DeKalb County this morning, asking people to wear masks, social distance, stay home if possible, wash their hands, and get tested for COVID-19. DeKalb CEO Michael Thurman says he believes it is the first time a government in the southeast U.S. used the emergency alert system for such a message. He added the county sent the alert after hearing Governor Kemp say he won't make masks mandatory or put certain statewide orders back in place. You have to deal with the cards as you receive them. And so I would prefer that masks were mandatory. They're not. So that means we have to use every other resource we have available to us. Thurman says with DeKalb County having the third highest number of cases in the state and people planning holiday gatherings for this weekend, time was of the essence. Numbers as of 3 p.m. today show statewide Georgia set another daily record for new COVID-19 cases with nearly 3,500. 
DeKalb also continuing to see spikes in new cases after setting its own single day high on Tuesday. We're seeing much higher numbers of positive cases in our younger populations, 30 and under. So that's very worrisome, particularly as we walk into this um, 4th of July weekend. DeKalb's Board of Health Director, Dr. Sandra Elizabeth Ford, says unless drastic changes are taken, the pandemic will continue on for at least several more months. We've got to have masks on still. We've got to continue to wash hands and we've got to continue to distance socially um, or we're going to continue to be fighting this disease well into the fall. Cobb County is pushing back the start date of school this year or for next year. Rather, students were originally supposed to head back on August 3rd, but it's now been delayed to August 17th to give them more time to prepare amid the surge of COVID-19 cases. Parents were supposed to be given the option of choosing in person or remote learning for students. The district says it altered parents uh, of a new timeline, alerted parents rather to a new timeline to make that decision. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Once again tonight, I'm with you on TV. At the same time, we're talking to folks on Facebook Live. We had more than 200 just a little while ago now, around 150 people. A lot of folks are asking about the holiday for the 4th. Many of them saying that their weekend has already started because they're off on Friday and have a long holiday weekend. And things are actually looking pretty good to kick off the weekend here where we don't have a lot of rain right now. We are dry here in Atlanta. We have a couple of showers up in North Georgia, and then we had some showers over to the west a little bit earlier in Paulding County, parts of Cobb and into Douglas County, but those are have fallen apart. So that's over. Now we have this one that developed just a little while ago over in Walton County, and I just got confirmation from some of the folks on Facebook Live from of what we're seeing here in Walton County is actually hitting the ground there and it is some good rain near Walnut Grove. They said they had a good shower that's north of Jersey, also to the west of the Monroe area that's drifting over toward the south and the West could make it over into northern Rockdale and northern Newton County, but we do expect that it'll weaken somewhat. We are seeing these showers up in North Georgia weaken as well. Just a few scattered showers there in parts of Towns County, right on the line at Raven County, northern White County, a few showers, also western White County and over into Lumpkin County as well. Take a look at the bigger picture and you can see what we're watching around North Georgia and Metro Atlanta. As you can see, uh, most of us are dry. Stay with us. We'll let you know if we see any additional showers that are going to be developing during the day tomorrow or for the rest of the long holiday weekend. We'll talk more about that coming up. All right, Chris, we'll see you then. Well, the upcoming 4th of July weekend gives families a chance to get away even during the pandemic. Airbnb is taking aggressive action, making sure guests are as safe as can be. 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez explains. The development was not a response to the pandemic. I'd say the decision to really share it out widely today was. Airbnb is implementing a new policy to crack down on unauthorized parties. It's not just like a policy in name only. We, we literally are going to block that reservation. The platform is banning users under the age of 25 with no track record of positive reviews from renting an entire house in their area. Anything that we can do to limit the ability for, for someone to organize a gathering along those lines, we're going to do it. It comes just as folks are gearing up for the 4th of July weekend, while we are continuing to see record COVID-19 cases here in Georgia. Dr. Sharag Patel, Population Health Medical Director at Wellstar, says if you are planning on taking a trip, make sure it's somewhere you can adhere to CDC's guidelines. Going to the mountains, going to a lake house that's more desolate, I think it's going to be much safer than hitting the big city, the club, or the beach. Mountains are top of mind for those wanting to venture out this weekend. Airbnb says searches for listings in Blue Ridge Mountains are up by nearly 15% compared to this time last year. People want to travel, but they don't necessarily want to get on a plane. They want to be able to travel like within a tank of gas is sort of what we're seeing. Airbnb says it also has enhanced the cleaning protocols during the pandemic to keep both hosts and guests safe during this time. Some surprising good news about the economy today. The U.S. is actually gaining nearly 5 million jobs last month. So that brings the national unemployment rate down to 11 percent. This is according to the latest data from the Labor Department. And this is the second month in a row that we've uh, seen a steady decline in unemployment.
However, we're still far from the historic lows of 3.5 percent we saw earlier this year. Georgia saw some of the largest decreases in first-time unemployment claims. New numbers show that Georgia's Department of Labor paid out more than $7.5 billion in state and federal unemployment benefits over the last 15 weeks. And even though the president is saying the economy is undergoing an incredible comeback, not everyone who has headed back to work feels the same way. 11 Alive's Doug Richards explains. This DeKalb County hair salon closed down when Governor Kemp ordered salons closed this spring. It reopened in early May and has been open for two months. Technically, it means the hairstylists in the salon are back in the workforce, except that the work has been more than a little thin. Chairs were mostly empty when we visited at midday, and hairstylist Li Chow says it's been that way since the beginning of May. This business being open for 26 years, Little Scissors, and uh, everybody had the lowest number in their career, 25 years career. Yeah, but this is the slowest ever since the shop opened. We got time to chill, a lot of time like that. Chow says she applied for state unemployment while the salon was closed, but never heard back from the Department of Labor. She says working with only a fraction of her customers is hurting her pocketbook. Georgia's unemployment rate soared as the pandemic started, then dropped in May after workers, like the folks here at Little Scissors, went back to work at jobs that are paying them a fraction of what they were making a year ago. Still to come, a mask is a mask is a mask? So does it really matter how your face is covered up when it comes to following the rules when stores require them? Our Verify team takes a look at that tonight. And of course, don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Live YouTube channel. All you have to do is subscribe and join the conversation right there in the community section. We've got more 11 Live news in prime time after the break. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on... All right, welcome back, everyone. Stores and businesses all across the country are now requiring employees and customers to wear a face mask. But not all coverings are made equal, as one woman discovered during a trip to Walmart. Our Verify team looks at the retailer's policy. Here in the Verify team, we work for you. You send us your questions, and we work to find out what's real and what's not. What is it that you want the Verify team to find out? Today's question comes from Tierra Smith from Laurel, Maryland. And last week, I had an incident with La the Laurel Walmart. She says that she was wearing this face shield when she was denied entry. Can you tell me why I can't come in your store with my face mask? She recorded this video shortly after. You don't have a mask. You so what do I have on? That's a shield. An employee telling her that she needed a mask to enter and a shield just wasn't enough. I just want to be clear on what the policy is. So we're verifying this in two parts. First, we're answering whether Walmart's policies say someone should not be allowed in wearing a face shield rather than a face mask. And second, is there any evidence that a mask protects you better than a face shield? Face shields um, don't filter, but they physically block. 
Dr. Clifford Mitchell from the Department of Health in Maryland says that from a public health perspective, cloth masks are better than shields. If you have this very, very fine respiratory droplet that's hanging in the air as a very small particle, it actually will float around the edge or under the edge of the face shield and you'll be able to inhale it. So we can verify. Our experts say that cloth masks do protect more than a face shield. But what about that Walmart policy? First, we checked Governor Larry Hogan's executive order from mid-April. It simply requires customers to wear, in their words, face coverings and does not specify what kind. So we took Tierra's question right to Walmart itself to get an answer. And just hours after we brought this to their attention, a spokesperson confirmed that this was a mistake, saying face shields are absolutely allowed in Walmart stores. Quote, the miscommunication at the Laurel, Maryland location is being addressed, and we're working to get in touch with the customer to apologize and remedy the situation. So we can verify false. Walmart does not have a policy against face shields. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Tracker, still talking with more than 100 people on Facebook Live right now. And a lot of folks are confirming what we're seeing on radar with those few spotty showers up in North Georgia, also over on the west side. And uh, a lot of people are making me a little jealous talking about how uh, they have a three day weekend for the holiday and many of their weekends have already started here since some folks are off tomorrow. Um, and we're really starting off pretty nicely here with mainly dry weather, mild out there, but we do have a couple of showers that we're watching. Nothing in the city right now. Those showers on the west side that we were tracking earlier tonight have fallen apart in Douglas, Northern Carroll, and in Paulding County. But we have these showers that developed just a little while ago in Walton County. And you can see here as we put this into motion two hours ago, nothing was going on. And then this just developed right around Monroe and it's drifting over toward the south and west. It's really near the city of between and also near Jersey where we have some of those um, moderate showers, a couple pockets of heavier rain with that too. We don't think it's going to last very long, but just what happens is these are like pulse showers that just kind of develop with the heat and humidity and then they rain themselves out. So we really think that's going to be the case here. And then these showers up in North Georgia, mainly light showers now. Those are going to be falling apart as well as we continue to lose the heating of the day. Elsewhere, it is dry and for the rest of the night, most places will be dry as well. Let me show you what we're watching. Take a look now at what's happening out there. This is a picture that was sent in by one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers, Ken Colson in Kennesaw. Beautiful colors in the sunset tonight from uh, his view in Kennesaw. Uh, nice uh, yellows and oranges out there looking really good. Thank you, Ken, for sending that. He's one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. Now take a look at temperatures. We do have a little bit of a range in temperatures depending on which areas actually are seeing rain. We had a little bit of rain earlier in Atlanta, 1600s of an inch of rain here at Hartsfield Jackson. That dropped our temperatures from 89 to the 70s to 79. And then when that rain moved out quickly, the sun came back up. We went back up to 84. Now we're 81. So it's been kind of up and down. So these areas that got rain cooled off a little bit, a little bit more. Covington had some showers earlier was in the lower 70s, now back up to 77. Still 85 in Rome though. Athens, you were at 90 for a, a big, uh, a long time today, you, actually above 90, but you held at 90 through much of the evening. Now you're down to 83 degrees. Canton is at 79. We're gonna watch these temperatures tonight falling. We'll be in the 70s by tomorrow morning with mainly dry weather conditions as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours and the first part of the day tomorrow. Then we do hit 91 in the afternoon. We're going to have about a 30% chance for showers developing later on. You know we rate your weather on a scale from 1 to 11 where an 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with a 7 as we'll see a few of those showers. Now if you'll notice overnight tonight will be fine. In the morning dry, some sunshine looking really nice in the morning and then at lunchtime a couple of clouds mixing in in the afternoon, not a widespread coverage of rain, just that heat and humidity kind of bubbling some things up to give us that 30% chance for showers and then another dry start on the 4th, but in the afternoon on the 4th, again, just about a 30% chance for scattered showers. So when you look at this map and see all of those thunderstorm symbols as we go through the weekend, please know that we're going to have a lot of dry hours. Um, but just that chance for some of the afternoon showers to pop up and that's going to be with us Sunday too. And then the rain chance is a little bit higher for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. 40% chance Monday, 50% chance Tuesday and Wednesday, and back to 40% chance Thursday. And those higher rain chances will help keep the temperatures back down into the 80s. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. You know, the science says masks can keep people healthy, but can they also be good for the economy? We are connecting the dots.
cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. Well, we have heard wearing a face mask during the pandemic saves lives, and it may also save the economy. Let's connect the dots. The use of masks during this global coronavirus pandemic has become a hot button issue, but a new report puts the debate in stark economic terms. Let's connect the dots. Goldman Sachs crunched the numbers. It wanted to find out what a national face mask mandate would mean for the economy. The team of economists found that areas that did not impose a rule on face coverings showed more COVID-19 infections and deaths, findings that are backed up by other research. And here's how that affects the economy. With a surge of cases in part of the country, many states are having to halt or roll back reopening plans. The Goldman Sachs economists project those lockdowns will cost 5% of the gross domestic product. That translates to $1 trillion. They also calculated the rate of spread with and without a face mask mandate. The researchers estimated the daily growth rate for new infections without a nationwide face mask order is just over 17% per week, but just over 7% with an order. A John Hopkins epidemiologist cautioned in the Washington Post that it's hard to make a straight connection between mask orders and infection rates because of other steps leaders take that could affect the numbers. But she does say her research has found masks are an important component to stopping the pandemic. Still to come on primetime, a family says their teenager was killed over $10 after he was out selling water bottles. Tonight, the family is out in the community speaking out against teen gun violence. Friends, we see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. 
We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. Thank you for joining us today, Mayor. We have a number of questions we want to get to with you, and I want to start with the big mask debate. So right now, the city of Savannah is the only Georgia city with a mask requirement. Do you plan to issue a mask mandate for the city of Atlanta? Well, it's something that we are in discussions about, and what I know is this, that with or without um, a, something mandating that people wear masks, people should still wear masks. Mm -hmm. And it is really the most unselfish thing that you can do as it relates to COVID-19 that not only protects yourself, um, but the people around you. And when I'm looking at numbers for COVID-19 that are very alarming, um, I haven't seen numbers this high in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And this is something that people should take seriously. And so we'll continue to watch what happens mm -hmm. in Savannah and then make our decisions accordingly. Is it something you are thinking about? It is something I am thinking about, yes. Okay. Um, I saw your tweet the other day. You said that you're a realist and not an alarmist, but we have never seen numbers like this before since the pandemic in Georgia. Yeah, it's, it's very concerning. And I receive a daily update from our team and it shows um, the seven day period data and how high the numbers are ticking up. And there was a point in time when our numbers had gotten down as low as 8% um, over a week's time. They're now over 20%. And so I, I think, again, we have to take responsibility for ourselves, but also think about the people who are around us who are vulnerable. We know that COVID-19 is making healthy people very, very sick. But also think about our children and think about our seniors and people with compromised immune systems and even people with underlying health conditions, and these are very common conditions in our city, asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes, a lot of people don't even know that they suffer from these things, but if they are infected with COVID-19, it could prove deadly. Do you think the governor should mandate everyone wear masks? I think it would be helpful if we had some consistency throughout the state, but the reality is this, even with a mandate, um, if people don't take it seriously, then it, it's going to be very difficult for us to enforce. But I do think any type of consistent messaging that we can have coming from the governor's office is helpful. I'm very encouraged that he's going around the state encouraging people 
to wear a mask and and we'll see if it's um, helpful in Savannah in terms of um, their their numbers and rate of infection. And whether it's enforceable as well. So we saw the governor out with the U.S. Surgeon General today putting that message out for everyone to wear masks. What do you think is to blame for the surge of infections here in Georgia? Well, my understanding and talking with our healthcare professionals, they're a combination of things. One, the reopening certainly did not help us with our numbers. And then we had so many um, mass gatherings over the past few weeks. And so I, I think it has, has been um, a, a perfect, um, unfortunate storm in terms of opening up suddenly and then adding on top of that mass gatherings. Um, and so I think, I, I don't know that the experts know definitively um, which caused what, but what we do know is where we are today and our infection rates um, are going through the roof. Do you think we opened up too fast? I do. I, I've always said that I, I thought we needed to be a, a little more thoughtful in terms of how we reopen and that it should have been a much more phased approach and also an opportunity for us to do more contact tracing. When we look at where the numbers are lower in the country, it is in the Northeast where they were a bit slower to reopen. But um, we are where we are now. We have to deal with what's in front of us today. And what's in front of us is that we have numbers that are, that are going up by the day. And we just have to continue um, to be vigilant. Yeah. And again, it's hot. So people don't want to wear masks outside. That's understandable. But if that's the case and you have the opportunity to stay inside, then we just encourage people to do that as well. So you mentioned the Northeast. I'm from the Northeast. And uh, just earlier this week, states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut mandated that uh, if Georgians come to those states, they have to quarantine. It's a mandatory quarantine for 14 days if they choose to visit. Do you agree with states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut making this mandate on Georgians if they want to come visit? I certainly understand because they um, have worked very hard to try and manage the outbreaks in their states. Yeah. And so it's, it's understandable that they want to continue to do what they need to do to protect the residents uh, within, within their states. And I just wish that we had been a, a, a bit more thoughtful in terms of how we reopen, not just in Georgia, but really throughout the Southeast. And when you look at where our numbers are, are ticking up, they are in states that open up very early. And um, again, the, it, we can Monday morning quarterback, but for us to make a difference now, we've got to look at where we are and, and look, at, look ahead. And a huge part of that, again, is avoiding mass gatherings and wearing a mask when you are out in public and, and keeping your distance. What do you say to anyone thinking about attending a big July 4th celebration or firework celebration this weekend? Just keep your distance. Stay six feet apart and wear a mask. It, it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can't do that, then just stay home. So let's turn now to morale within the Atlanta Police Department. The foundation president says morale has plummeted to an all-time low following a turbulent two weeks that we saw toward the end of May and the beginning of June. Eight officers now facing criminal charges. Five have lost their jobs. Officers say they don't feel valued. Is there anything, Mayor, that you've been able to say or do recently to boost morale and make these officers feel valued? And also, do you think that's your responsibility now? Well, I think it's unfortunate that our officers feel that way, but I think it's not just in Atlanta. I think that's happening across the country and it has. this has been trending this way for a very long time. But that being said, I understand that our officers have concerns um, uh, about going out on the streets and, and not just the way that they feel that the public um, is treating them, but certainly um, their response to my response to what's happened in the city. That being said, I've always been committed to public safety in our city as and especially to our police officers. Um, during 
the first uh, couple of years of, in office, I put in place a 30% pay increase for our police officers, which was the largest in the history of the city. And I don't say that um, simply to mention the monetary part of it, because that money doesn't make somebody always feel valued. But, but to remind our officers that when I didn't have the support of any police unions in the city, I still did what I thought was the right thing to do because I believe that they deserve to be paid and I believe they deserve to have the opportunity to live in it, be able to live in our city, afford to live in our city and not have to work two to three jobs. So in the same way that I made that commitment to our officers, I just ask that they be reminded of the commitment that they made to our city when they took their oath. Nobody said that this job would be easy. It's not easy being mayor, certainly not easy being a police officer, but there's a commitment that comes with that. There will be bumps in the road. There have been bumps in the road. We are mindful of that. Um, but the changes that we are making, not just for the safety of our community, but for the safety of our officers as well. And I think we'll get to the other side of this, but I think in the same way our demonstrators have to express themselves, um, I think that our officers are taking the opportunity to do that as well. So do you think there's anything extra that you would, you would need to do during this unprecedented time to show those officers that they're valued? Is there anything extra that needs to happen? I think that we need to be very clear on what our expectations are and to the extent that we have failed our officers in any way with the training that we are providing our officers, I think it is our responsibility as a city to make it very clear what our rules and regulations are, what our expectations are. So we've done that with a series of uh, things that have come out of the advisory committee. We are looking forward to getting input from our officers. And one of our student activists uh, said something that I, I thought was so very important. He said, this cannot be a we versus, uh, an us versus them conversation. It has to be a we conversation. And I think part of that we conversation is making sure that our police officers are at the table and, and are able to share their thoughts and concerns um, about how we transform policing in our city. Well, you are a contender to be Joe, Bi Joe Biden's vice president. Do you want the job? You know, I want Joe Biden to make the best choice that's going to help him defeat Donald Trump. And so if my name is, is called, that's a conversation I'll have at that time, but I don't get too high, I don't get too low, and I don't get too far ahead. I, I look at what's in front of me, and what's in front of me right now is making sure our city is where it needs to be. Do you think it's important for Joe Biden to select a woman of color? I think it's important for him to select the person who's going to help him win and then help him govern, because I... Every, everything about America has changed. Yeah. Um, there were so many problems that we knew existed in our country and that we were focused on, but certainly not in the way that we've been focused over the past several weeks. And I think if you talk with anyone who went through the civil rights movement, they will even say that this mobilization across the globe is even different than that movement just in terms of the scale. So mm -hmm. I think that Joe Biden should have whomever by his side, he believes can help him lead our country through this. All right, Mayor, I appreciate your time. I wish I could hug you in person. And I you in person. <laughs> <laughs> right before the unrest, things were getting a little, you know, a little easier in which I thought maybe I could see you in person for this interview, but I appreciate your time nevertheless. So nice to see you always. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, 
extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. A family working to raise awareness about teen gun violence after they say an 18-year-old was shot and killed during a fight with another teenager over 10 bucks. Well, the story shocking the community with thousands of you expressing your condolences on our Facebook page. Latasha Gibbons has the latest tonight. I was sad to have you heard the Man, my brother just got shot. We need an ambulance. He's not moving, but he's just laying on the ground, bro. This is part of the 911 call released by police made moments after 18-year-old Jelani Pless was shot and killed last Saturday in Midtown while selling bottled water. Jelani's friend told his family he and another teen selling water got into a fight over a $10 bill a customer gave to Jelani instead of him. Thursday, Jelani's family, along with activists, returned to the area to raise awareness about teens and gun violence. Tamika Pless, Jelani's mother, was too emotional to talk, but his little sister, Makira Brown, shared the agony over losing her big brother. She also has a message for the juvenile police have issued an arrest warrant for. It's hard losing your best friend. It's hard losing the closest thing to you, your, your protector, your brother, the closest thing to you. You're only three years younger than me. Please just turn yourself in. So when I heard about this murder, man, it just really just it just set me off a little bit. Keith Sorry. Lewis, founder of I'm a Father First, sponsors the Corner Boys to help organize teens who want to sell water during the summer. He says the group pays a flat $50 to each teen, regardless of how much they sell, so they don't have to fight over territory or become too aggressive when approaching customers. Stephen Moore, Jelani's uncle, wants the city to provide more programs to Atlanta teens. Instead of being out here on the corner, you know, having territorial fights and killing and shooting each other over a buck or a dollar, it's just senseless, man. GBI records don't track the number of teens over 18 who die from gun violence, but officials say based on current cases, the number of children up to the age of 17 dying due to gun violence is trending higher in 2020 than this time last year. This is based on preliminary data. And according to GBI records, at least 21 children have died from gun violence in Georgia this year. The youngest victim, just five years old, at least 13 of the victims were African-Americans. 
I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and we're still tracking just a few of those light showers that are out there. You know, there haven't been a lot of them tonight, but there are still a couple that are still lingering around right now. I'm going to show you what we're watching. I just put my clicker over here. Sorry about that. Where we are dry in Atlanta, we had a few showers here over on the west side in parts of Cobb County, Paulding, moving into northern Carroll, near to Douglas County. Those have fallen apart. Also, a few showers up in north Georgia that are falling apart. You can see these uh, that are were over on the west side are no longer really there and a few in Alabama, but those aren't moving toward us. They're moving down toward the south and west. We have this one in Walton County that we've been watching. It just developed came up from nowhere, just kind of bubbled up there and is drifting over toward the west. It had some moderate rain with it. Now that's showing signs of falling apart as it moves into the northern parts of Rockdale County right here and the southern parts of Walt of uh, Gwinnett County. I really think it's going to keep falling apart before it makes it over to the cab. And then in North Georgia, some of these showers have been holding together for a little bit. They're not particularly heavy. They were heavier earlier. Now just a little bit of moderate shower activity up around the northern White County area north of Helen and then everything else is pretty much falling apart and no additional big time showers around for the rest of the night. Now let me show you what we're watching when you take a look at the, um, the weather headlines for the rest of the nighttime hours. We're really in this summertime pattern where we see just typical heat and humidity, plenty of that around. And when that kind of mixes together, in the afternoon where, the, where you have the prime heating. That's when we see a few of those afternoon showers that just kind of pop up from nowhere, like that one we saw in Walton County. It just developed. It didn't move in with a front or a line or anything. It just kind of developed, and then it drifts and kind of rains itself out. And that's what we'll be seeing not only for tomorrow, but for a part of your weekend too. But please know that it's not going to be raining all the time. We're going to have a lot of dry hours. These are just the typical <laughs> excuse me, afternoon variety of pop-up showers, and I don't think we'll see a lot of them around. I want you to notice this. Take a look at our high today, 89, and our low this morning was 71. Well, you know where we should be for this time of year? The average for today's date is 89 and 71. So we were right on target for what we should be here for the second day of July. We did pick up some rain. I know earlier we were telling you that Hartsfield Jackson wasn't showing anything, but that was because that was recorded before the rain came through. The latest update shows 16 hundredths of an inch of rain. So our surplus now is just under three and a half inches above where we should be. Now look what happened when that rain came through. You know, we had the mild morning this morning. It was dry, dry for the first part of the afternoon. We got up to 88 and then 89 before the showers came through. Just it was a brief shower that came through over the airport, but it was enough rain to cool us back down to 79 at four o'clock, then 80 degrees at five o'clock. And then that rain moved through so quickly and it cleared out. The sun was actually able to come out again before it set. And then we bumped back up to 84 by seven. And now we're in those lower 80s right now. And we'll see those temperatures that'll be falling during the rest of the nighttime hours. 81 here outside the city. We have some 70s around, but it's pretty mild just about everywhere. A lot of folks on Facebook Live when I was talking to them earlier, we're talking about what a pleasant night it was out there. We will hit 91 tomorrow, about a 30% chance for showers. We'll give that a seven on the wasometer. You can see any of those little isolated showers out there now are falling apart. It'll be dry to start in the morning. Some sunshine with those mild temperatures at lunchtime, mostly sunny and then turning partly cloudy in the afternoon with that 30% chance for showers. And we'll hold on to that 30% chance on Saturday for the 4th and on Sunday on the 5th with highs in the lower 90s throughout the period. We do see those rain chances coming back up a little bit more Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday with high temperatures dipping back down into the 80s next week. Oh yes, those booms. Have you heard that sound in your neighborhood lately? It's not even the 4th of July yet. We're still two days away and authorities say more fireworks are going off. It's been happening at all hours of the night for weeks. I don't know about you, but I've heard it for sure in my neighborhood. So some say it's COVID boredom and others think it might go on well after July 4th. So whatever the reason, these fireworks have a lot of you talking. Mary Jo says it's obvious why fireworks are so popular. There's nothing else to do. She thinks there is going to be a lot more this year than in the past, so don't plan on sleeping. And Sarah, on the other hand, not happy about the noise. She says fireworks should be banned in and near residential areas or mandate silent fireworks, but 
you know, you like to hear the pop with the fireworks. And KR says, hey, maybe people are just celebrating that we are halfway through 2020. And if that's the case, then I do support that. So tonight on Up Late at 11 our, on our sister station, 11 Alive, we talk to the professionals to find out what's up with the wave of fireworks. And while you wait, you can head over to our comment section and let us know what you think. We'll be right back. Committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed. Well, the AJC Peachtree Road Race has been pushed back from July 4th, of course, to November this year because of COVID-19. But the only person to run every single year says he is not about to miss this thing. We're talking about Bill Thorne. He was one of only 110 people to run the first Peachtree in 1970 and has lined up ever since the 89 year old says it gets harder every year, but crossing the finish line only feels more satisfying. Now, when he heard the official race would be postponed, he knew he still wanted to go out there and mark the occasion on July 4th. So he set up his own course that he plans to run Saturday morning, starting from his mailbox at 7 a.m. He says he also plans to be there for the official race on Thanksgiving Day. If it counted on Saturday, I would be 89, but when we have it this year, which is Thanksgiving Day, I will be 90. I'll be 90 in September, and that means if I can keep going the next year, I'll also be 90. Man, that is so inspiring. By the way, Bill, he works out every single day. And he says his routine is not that hard, but uh, what makes it so special is his commitment to showing up. 
You know, in so many times this year, uh, this time of year, we're worried about whether or not it's going to rain or how hot it's going to be on the 4th, but no PC road race for that. We'll just be watching scattered showers in the afternoon. You know, only isolated stuff that might interrupt your cookout and then more rain chances next week. All right, well, that will do it for us tonight. We will see you back here at 10 o'clock. Of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this? 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Now at 10 on this Thursday night, new details in the Wendy's arson investigation. The two men arrest in the case tonight. How, a -R -B and, uh, how Airbnb is taking health and safety precautions to protect their guests this 4th of July weekend. Fireworks night after night all across Georgia and the country. What are the theories behind this long wave of fireworks? I'm Hope Ford. I'll have that story all new at 10. But right now at 10, another record breaking day for COVID-19 cases in Georgia with more than 3,400 new cases since yesterday. This comes as coronavirus cases rise in 40 out of 50 states. Now that is according to the latest data from the COVID tracking project. People across the state want to see a change in the right direction, and that is why more than 1,400 Georgia doctors have come together to urge Governor Kemp to make masks mandatory. And today, the doctor sent a letter warning of a critical shortage of hospital beds if the state does not act now. Investigator Rebecca Lindstrom spoke with one of the doctors about their concerns. The doctors who wrote this letter want the governor to close down bars and nightclubs, prohibit the number of people at gatherings to 25, including at church, 
and they want local leaders to have authority to make the rules residents follow. To close down when they need to close down, to mandate masks, even though the governor is not willing to mandate masks. It could make a huge difference. To get a sense for how this virus is now impacting our community, we're breaking down the pandemic into two phases, basically cutting the plateau period in half. Phase one is the date of our first COVID-related death in March to May 14th. Phase two goes from May 15th to today. Even though our current phase has fewer days, we already have more COVID cases. Some of that is due to testing. We've conducted nearly 384,000 more tests than in the first part of the pandemic. Dr. Thompson says studies show those cases are coming from super spreader events. Think Memorial Day, large social gatherings and those family get togethers where we kind of let our guard down. The fact more young people are getting infected in this round is little comfort for doctors. It's not going to stay there. We have much more virus circulating in the community than we had before we began the shelter in place order. So far, more people were hospitalized in phase one. On average, each day, 25 people were admitted to the ICU. In phase two, that average is lower, 18 a day. But since our cases didn't start to swell until Saturday, Dr. Thompson believes next week, that number will change significantly. It's not about scaring people. Panic doesn't help. Scaring people doesn't help. But knowledge is power. And we have to emphasize the fact that, that Georgia is now growing out of control in terms of this pandemic. Right now, there are 1,649 people receiving care for COVID-19 in the hospital. That is more than any day since GMO started reporting this data on May 1st. New tonight at 10, the Cobb County School District is delaying the start of the fall semester due to COVID-19 concerns. Classes will now begin August 17th. The Cobb County School Board made a decision in order to give students, teachers, and administration time to prepare for the school year. Parents also have more time to decide if they want their children to attend in-person classes or stay home for the remote learning. Over to DeKalb County, which issued a COVID-19 health alert ahead of the 4th of July weekend. This alert asked people to wear masks, social distance, stay home if possible, wash their hands, and get tested for COVID-19. The county says it decided to send the alert after Governor Kemp said he will not make wearing masks mandatory. You have to deal with the cards as you receive them. And so I would prefer that masks were mandatory. They're not. So that means we have to use every other resource we have available to us. DeKalb continues to see spikes in new cases after setting its own single day high on Tuesday. It's also seen higher numbers among younger people ages 30 and under. Remember to be vigilant this holiday weekend. Some COVID-19 testing sites will be open. The Department of Health released a list of locations and the limited hours that they are open. For the complete list, all you have to do is go to 11 Alive. Dot com, dot com and then click on the scene on TV section. Tonight, two new arrests in connection to the Wendy's arson investigation last month. And now a total of three people are charged in the inferno at the fast food spot on University. That's in southeast Atlanta. Investigators tell our John Sherrick they are still not done tracking suspects. The latest two Wendy's arson suspects were booked here into the Fulton County Jail. So now there are three suspects among the multitudes of people investigators say had a hand in this. The Wendy's on University torched, investigators say, an out of control inferno. The restaurant destroyed on June 13th, less than 24 hours after a white Atlanta police officer shot and killed a black DUI suspect, Rayshard Brooks, in the Wendy's parking lot. As Brooks was running away and appeared to turn and fire a taser at the officer, the shooting erupting into a firestorm of protests and prosecutions and police department upheavals. While arson investigators continue to work their case, three people charged so far. The latest arrests, 33-year-old John Wade of East Point. Investigators say Wade was a protest organizer. And 23-year-old Chisholm Kingston of Conyers, both charged with first-degree arson. And investigators have been saying all along, a lot of people set fire to the Wendy's that night. The first arson suspect charged, 29-year-old Natalie White, arrested two weeks ago. She's the woman Rayshard Brooks had told police was his girlfriend as the officers were questioning Brooks just prior to their confrontation. 
Natalie White's attorney later said she was just a friend of Brooks. And the Crime Stoppers reward is still in place, up to $15,000 for help finding all of the suspects. New tonight, the NFL has announced it will play Lift Every Voice and Sing before each game in week one. The song will be performed prior to the Star Spangled Banner. That's according to ESPN. The move comes four weeks after NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell pledged to work with players in the fight against social injustice. The NFL season opener is scheduled for September 10th with the world champion Kansas City Chiefs hosting the Houston Texans. Now to the holiday safety concerns. The upcoming 4th of July weekend gives families an opportunity to get away even during the pandemic. Airbnb is taking aggressive action, making sure that guests are as safe as can be. 11 Alive's Elvin Lopez explains. The development was not a response to the pandemic. I'd say the decision to really share it out widely today was. Airbnb is implementing a new policy to crack down on unauthorized parties. It's not just like a policy in name only. We, we literally are going to block that reservation. The platform is banning users under the age of 25 with no track record of positive reviews from renting an entire house in their area. Anything that we can do to limit the ability for, for someone to organize a gathering along those lines, we're going to do it. It comes just as folks are gearing up for the 4th of July weekend, while we are continuing to see record COVID-19 cases here in Georgia. Dr. Sharag Patel, Population Health Medical Director at Wellstar, says if you are planning on taking a trip, make sure it's somewhere you can adhere to CDC's guidelines. Going to the mountains, going to a lake house that's more desolate, I think it's going to be much safer than hitting the big city, the club, or the beach. Mountains are top of mind for those wanting to venture out this weekend. Airbnb says searches for listings in Blue Ridge Mountains are up by nearly 15% compared to this time last year. People want to travel, but they don't necessarily want to get on a plane. They want to be able to travel like within a tank of gas is sort of what we're seeing. Airbnb says it also has enhanced the cleaning protocols during the pandemic to keep both hosts and guests safe during this time. Also ahead of Independence Day weekend, states from coast to coast freezing or rolling back reopening plans. Several beaches across the country are closing for the 4th of July holiday to manage crowds. This while President Trump continues to downplay the spike in new right. infections in the U.S. I think we're going to be very good with the coronavirus. I think that at some point uh, that's going to sort of just disappear. The president claimed his administration has saved millions of lives. That's a quote, blaming China for the spread of the disease. Coming up after the break, we go behind the recent trend of shooting off nightly fireworks across the country. And also, we're not seeing the nightly trend of thunderstorms that we've been dealing with lately. We have fewer showers around out there tonight. These are not producing any thunder and lightning, and they're falling apart. Stay with us. I'll let you know if they'll redevelop, not only for your Friday, but for the 4th of July, too. Newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know. Skies lighting up every night across the state and the country because of fireworks. It's been happening for weeks. We know the unexpected sounds can trigger PTSD and frighten dogs and animals. And the sudden shows are also making many anxious. New at 10, Hope Ford looked into what might be behind this, this wave of fireworks. Night after night, from New York City to South Atlanta, fireworks going off at all hours for weeks. Some people like Alex were inspired, heading to the store to grab his own supply. Maybe want to join the fun. But for others, the impromptu shows are unnerving. It makes me kind of nervous and, and unsettled. Dean Stockwell lives in Athens and is having trouble sleeping since fireworks started going off every night in the middle of June. I don't get scared easily, but you know, I'll jump still when they go off. Um, just because you're not expecting it. In Atlanta, near the skate park in Old Fourth Ward, Spencer Osborne's getting used to the nightly display. And all of a sudden, it's a few fireworks. You look outside, you see smoke. And people have honestly started to become a bit desensitized to it at this point. And there's more stories like this in neighborhood apps, making people wonder what's going on. Well, several sheriff and police departments tell us they've seen an uptick in fireworks complaints this year. Gwinnett County received 132 calls in 2019, but 313 in 2020. Cops saw an increase from from 55 fireworks complaints to 219 last month. So why is it happening? There's four theories, according to people we talked to. Theory one, quarantine boredom. The switch turned on and it's been busy. Business is, well, booming for fireworks companies because of backyard celebrations. Phantom Fireworks reported their sales doubled at all 80 stores across the U.S. And Steve Puthoff at Pyro City Fireworks in Conyers definitely noticed a spike in sales. Obviously, everybody's been pent up. Uh, we've had people come in for graduations, birthdays. Just everybody celebrating to be out and out of the house. In theory two, recent protests. Although fireworks were used by some during the early days of the protest, they still sounded off for hours across the state even when there wasn't a protest. The next theory is more of a conspiracy. Social media lit up with a theory that the government is conducting psychological warfare. But given that families were visiting stores like Pyro since May and others witnessed neighbors or kids firing them off. When seeing ordinary people setting off fireworks um, from that skate park. There's not much to support theory three. The fourth theory is the time of year. Police say despite recent higher numbers, fireworks calls always increase from June to July. And since many activities remain canceled and it's legal in Georgia to pop fireworks all year between 10 a.m. and 11.59 p.m., the professionals think this may last for a while. I anticipate we're gonna be busier than normal until Labor Day. But others hope this all fizzles out after Independence Day. And police tell me they haven't noticed any patterns or anything out of the ordinary when it comes to fireworks calls other than they are receiving more of them. Are police responding to all of those noise complaints, particularly since they're getting a lot of them? Well, some of the departments did tell me, you know, if they're overwhelmed with fireworks complaints, and especially if it's within that window of time where it's legal, they're going to prioritize other more serious calls first before sending an officer out for a fireworks complaint. All right, Hope Ford, thank you. We appreciate the report and the information. Fourth of July right around the corner. Yeah, and now to something else raining down from the sky. Scattered showers across the metro today, but we're expecting weather to improve as we head into the 4th of July weekend. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb joins us for that. Hey there, Chris. You know, Natasha, it's going to be that typical summertime pattern where we have the heat and humidity that will just bubble up some showers. That's what happened out there today. A lot of us made it through the day without any rain at all, but there were a few of those showers that popped up, and the ones that did pop up had some pockets of heavy rain with it and thunder and lightning. And now that we're losing the heat, of the day, any of those showers that developed out there are pretty much falling apart. You can see here in Metro Atlanta, not much going on here. Those showers over on the west side earlier, they're gone now. We have a few showers that we've been watching over here in Walton County. They are falling apart as they now are right there at the county line, right there at Gwinnett County, Walton County, and also into Rockdale County. These showers over in West Georgia fell apart a little bit earlier, and then we still have a few lighter showers in Northeast Georgia. These have been hanging out for a little bit. They had a 
have some heavier rain or more moderate rain with them earlier. Now it's just light stuff and that's going to be ending very soon and nothing else in the area. So I really think for the rest of the nighttime hours, most places are going to stay dry and then tomorrow afternoon with the heat and humidity again, we'll see a few of these isolated showers that'll pop up. Take a look at what we're watching. This is a beautiful picture sent in to us by one of our 11 Alive community storm trackers, Ken Colson. This is from Kennesaw looking at the sunset tonight and the beautiful colors there in the sky as it was going down. So it was a, a nice shot. Thank you, Ken, for sending us that picture and temperatures out there right now. You know, we have a little bit of a range of temperatures. Some are in the 80s, some are in the 70s. It's mild just about everywhere. One of the cooler spots is in Clayton. We did have some areas that had a little bit of rain earlier and that would briefly bring those temperatures down, but then they came back up once that rain ended. And that's what happened here in Atlanta. We got up to 89 for high today. We dropped to 79 with a few showers and then back into the 80s before the sun went down. Tomorrow, we're going to get up to 91. We will go with a 7 on the wasometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We'll also see a few of those scattered showers that will pop up in the afternoon, but the rain chance is only at about 30%. So you can see those rain chances tonight all falling apart. Nothing going on in the morning. At noontime, we're still dry, and then in the afternoon, there you see just a few of those pop-up showers developing, but it won't be widespread. And on Saturday, it's pretty much the same thing. It's a dry start in the morning, at lunchtime dry, with a couple of showers trying to develop in North Georgia. And then in the afternoon on Saturday for the 4th, about a 30% chance for some scattered showers around, and then they'll diminish during the evening as well. So if you're planning on cooking out here for the 4th of July, Noontime should be fine. Three o'clock should be good. Not worried about any rain coming in then, but it's in those late afternoon and early evening hours with that heat and humidity mixing together where it could be a little risky where there might be a couple of grills that have some raindrops on them. In fact, here's what we're looking, how we're looking for the 4th of July, starting off in the morning with mild temperatures. I do think we'll get up into the lower 90s for a high temperature here in the afternoon and those rain chances pretty much holding 20 to even 30% for those late afternoon hours. So a lot of dry hours around. I know when you see those thunderstorm symbols here for the 4th, it's not going to last all day long. There are just a couple of spotty showers around. On Sunday, we continue with a 30% chance for a shower. It's going to hold uh, high temperatures each afternoon in the lower 90s. And then the rain chances are a little bit higher Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 40% chance Monday, 50% chance Tuesday and Wednesday, and then Thursday back to 40%. And that'll also help the temperatures drop back down into the uh, 80s there for next week. Take a look at your weather wow moment. This is a really wild video coming out of Brazil where heavy rain and wind uh, were part of a deadly storm. Keep your eye on that yellow building in the back. All right, watch that because some crazy winds, look at that, just tore the roof off of that as those winds came through. Over 60 mile an hour winds confirmed there and that was strong enough to rip off the roof of that yellow building there in the back. The high winds also destroyed cars and even sank some boats off the coast. We would love to see your weather wow moment. Now, you don't have to go to Brazil <laughs> to get a weather wow moment. We get a lot of these from our local 11 Alive community storm trackers. You can become a part of that group on Facebook. Just search storm trackers, ask to become a member. We'll let you in and you can also share your weather wow moments with us. Chris, thank you. Coronavirus now forcing people to change their 4th of July traditions. But even with the HFC Peachtree Road Race pushed back to Thanksgiving, one man who has run the race every single year for 50 years has found a way to keep the spirit alive in a very safe way. Here's Caitlin Ross. The AJC Peachtree Road Race won't look like this for Bill Thorne this year, or like this, but that's okay by him. Well, I'm going to run. In fact, I just got through in Tyrone marking off a, a, a 10K course. He's invited anyone who wants to join him to run their own peach tree Saturday morning at 7 a.m. If you would like to... Uh, experience a 6.2 or however far you want to run and you want to go when I go meet me at seven o'clock in front of my mailbox. The 89 year old works out 365 days a year and has run the peach tree every single year since he was 39 years old. If it counted on Saturday I would be 89 but when we have it this year which is Thanksgiving Day I will be 90. I'll be 90 in September. And that means if I can keep going the next year, I'll also be 90. He's one of only 110 people who finished the original Peachtree race in 1970. Just like the first year, you didn't get a T-shirt. So you couldn't be running for a T-shirt. He's kept every shirt from every year since. But it's not about the T-shirt for Bill or even the big crowds. It's about consistency and commitment. 
peach tree is just something he refuses to miss. Never. I plan around it. That's just like anything. I make it a priority. We have more details about how the HAC Peachtree Road Race is going virtual on the 4th of July, including what you need to know if you plan to participate. That's on 11alive.com. The science tells us masks can keep people healthy, but can they also be good for the economy? We're connecting the dots coming up next. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. tells us wearing a face mask during the pandemic saves lives and it may also save the economy. Let's connect the dots. The use of masks during this global coronavirus pandemic has become a hot button issue, but a new report puts the debate in stark economic terms. Let's connect the dots. Goldman Sachs crunched the numbers. It wanted to find out what a national face mask mandate would mean for the economy. The team of economists found that areas that did not impose a rule on face coverings showed more COVID-19 infections and deaths, findings that are backed up by other research. And here's how that affects the economy. With a surge of cases in parts of the country, many states are having to halt or roll back reopening plans. The Goldman Sachs economists project those lockdowns will cost 5% of the gross domestic product. That translates to $1 trillion. They also calculated the rate of spread with and without a face mask mandate. The researchers estimated the daily growth rate for new infections without a nationwide face mask order is just over 17% per week, but just over 7% with an order. A John Hopkins epidemiologist cautioned in the Washington Post that it's hard to make a straight connection between mask orders and infection rates because of other steps leaders take that could affect the numbers. But she does say her research has found masks are an important component to stopping the pandemic. He may not be the first person you think of when you think of a frontline health worker, but he has a critical role. His story next. Completely touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon 
on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We she is 31 years of age and she put her pro basketball career on hold to fight for a man wrongly imprisoned. And this week, it all paid off. Maya Moore, great player, great basketball player, was there to greet Jonathan Irons in Missouri when he became a free man on Wednesday. She was overcome by emotion. Maya Moore dropped to her knees and then joined Irons and others in a group hug. Moore went to Collins Hill High School, as you know, and put her basketball career on hold to focus on having Irons burglary and assault convictions overturned. Just pointing people to, you know, just our story and our journey, I think will give people hope and encouragement for uh, how real meaningful change can happen. Irons is now 40, served 22 years of a 50-year sentence following his wrongful conviction. Moore says she is now going to take some time off before getting back to the WNBA. The U.S. sees another record high in new COVID-19 cases. New data shows in at least 45 states the rate of infection is higher than it was just a week ago, and it is still growing. One of the hardest hit states is Texas, where today Governor Greg Abbott mandated face masks. The order requires all Texans to wear a face covering over the nose and mouth in public spaces in counties with 20 or more positive coronavirus cases. Many states are now also closing beaches and rolling back reopening plans as they scramble to figure out the best ways to stop the spread of the virus. This is all complicated by the fact that we have 50 states going in 50 direct, different directions. Uh, we need a national plan, a national response for this national crisis. 
Today on Capitol Hill, lawmakers tackled concerns about medical supplies and the U.S. stockpile as hospitals in some hot spots are nearing capacity. Prior support and compassion at hospitals these days. Those are the qualities particularly needed from chaplains like the one you're about to meet. He might not be the first person you think of when you think of a hospital, but Brian Quinn plays a critical role at his. Here's Matt Pearl. <laughs> how you're all feeling about this. I'm sure you come with lots of different emotions, but what you do is very close to the heart of God. My name is Brian Quinn, and I've been doing a, this chaplaincy work for 34 years at Medical City Dallas. Just before all of this happened, I had weddings organized and other things organized, and then this happens. Uh, someone leadership asked me, are you guys coming in? I said, absolutely, we're coming in. I think we, we sometimes forget um, how lonely a patient can be in this hour of crisis. We're in this together. We're in it together. A burden for me, for hospital staff, has been this thing called compassion fatigue. When you go home at nights and you feel you have nothing left to give and you start to question why, trying to remind the staff that they need to take care of themselves because an unbalanced wheel will wear out the quickest. Working 12 hours in a COVID unit, the stress, the tension, the fears, the feelings, and to see their courage and compassion in light of the storm is, has been quite remarkable. I confess to you it's a choice that as caregivers and as chaplains, we have to choose every day. Uh, we have to choose hope. We may have been called in the night before to work a death, but we have to choose that day, hope because hope is an amazing thing. I couldn't do this if I didn't have the hope that there is always something better to come. God is still in the throne. His promise is true. He will not forget you. Matt Pearl is profiling several unseen faces on the front lines of COVID-19. Right now on 11alive.com, you can watch the story of the man documenting the lives of doctors and nurses dedicated to treating people who are fighting the virus. COVID-19 has a lot of people looking at their health care plan, and some of you have asked if getting tested could impact your premium. So we had Evan Kozlov with our Verify team ask the experts. From the very beginning of this pandemic, the Verify team has been working for you to try and clear up confusion by sticking to the truth. And we get all our information from the experts. This time we're focusing on healthcare premiums, the amount you pay for your health insurance each month. We're verifying will getting tested for COVID-19 or testing positive impact your healthcare premiums for 2021. First, our Verify researchers contacted this group, America's Health Insurance Plans, which describes itself as a national trade association representing the health insurance community. A spokesperson told us in part, quote, it is possible that if future costs for COVID-19 are projected to be extraordinarily high, premiums may increase for everyone, but you won't be charged more based on your individual health condition or decisions. Our Verify researchers then contacted four major providers, Care First, Kaiser Permanente, Cigna, and United Healthcare. They all confirm, no, neither a test nor a diagnosis of COVID-19 will impact your premiums. So we can verify this is false. Well, you know, there's a lot of things popping up, popping up online. So if you see a post online that you want us to verify, all you have to do is email us. Atlanta's mayor is pushing everyone to complete the 2020 census as the final deadline approaches. Yesterday, volunteers started reaching out to colleges, senior living facilities, and other places where people live in large groups to make sure that they are counted. Next month, they will focus on individual homes. So far, about 61% of Americans have sent back their census response. In Georgia, we are well below that, sitting at almost 58%. Mayor Bottom says Atlanta's response rate is better than in 2010, but she wants as many people to respond as possible to make sure that they are counted in some of our state's most important decisions. It's how we get money into our state and into our city. It's how we get money for our schools, our hospitals, our infrastructure. Everybody wants better roads, and it's how we get um, representation in Congress. 
as well. It even determines how our council, city council district lines will be drawn. Not only is it a big decision-making tool, the census can also be personal. For Mayor Bottoms, it helped keep records of her family history. This is a copy of the 1870 census. My grandmother's grandfather, a freed slave, is listed on this census. His name was Shepherd Peak. Mm -hmm. And he was from Crawfordsville, Georgia. This is his picture here. And so I am um, reminded of so many things during this time, just about the, the struggles and challenges um, that my ancestors overcame. But to see him reflected on this census seven years after the Emancipation Proclamation, I think really speaks to this responsibility that we all have. And when I see that he took the time to be a part of the census in the midst of all that was happening um, <clears throat> in his world, then certainly we can all take time to do the same. Mayor Bottoms talks about many things from the state's response to coronavirus to school in the fall. Sheba Russell does a really interesting interview with her. I, you you want to see it. She does a really good job with her, as you would expect from Sheba Russell, with her great experience from New York and with us for so many years. And you can check out the 11 Alive YouTube page. She also worked in Pittsburgh at one point. There we go. Well, the pandemic is already messing with the price of things like toilet paper and hand sanitizer and airline tickets. But what if it changes the price we pay for everything? We have more coming up. And any showers out there right now, there aren't a lot of them, but they're falling apart. But uh, stay with us. We'll let you know whether we'll see any additional showers developing, not only tomorrow, but for the rest of your holiday weekend. Three states announced plans to delay the upcoming high school football season. So what's going to happen here in Georgia? It's impossible not to worry when you look at COVID going crazy right now. We'll have an update coming up next in sports. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you 
First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to... The Supreme Court has now denied Congress access to secret grand jury testimony from special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation, at least for now. The court announced today it will hear the Trump administration's appeal of a lower court's order to turn over material to the House, but likely not before November's presidential election. The high court will keep the documents until the case is resolved. Congress wanted undisclosed details stemming from Mueller's investigation of Russian interference in 2016's election. In March, the appeals court ruled the documents should be turned over to the House Judiciary Committee for their investigation. However, the Department of Justice pointed out there wasn't an urgent need for the documents if the House is not furthering the impeachment probe. Meanwhile, voters in Russia have, a, have approved a constitutional amendment that would allow Vladimir Putin to remain in power for 16 more years. Russian election officials said nearly 78% of voters approved amendments to the constitution that will allow Putin to serve two more terms once his current one expires in 2024. Kremlin critics argued the reported numbers were falsified as support for Putin is declining. President Putin said he would never want to stay in power so long, which critics say is also a lie. Thousands of Georgia businesses received help from the Federal Paycheck Protection Program after the coronavirus pandemic hit. In total, the Small Business Administration says more than $14.3 billion went to the businesses here in the state. And that puts us at 10th in the nation for overall dollar amount. That's according to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And now Congress has extended the program by six weeks to try to use up about $130 billion in unused funds. Well, the country's economy is bouncing back slightly, but there are still fears that the pandemic could change the price we pay for everything that we buy. Brandon Riddiman explains what economists are watching closely. As our economy sails through COVID and all of its unknowns, one of the biggest questions is, what will the pandemic do to our money? I don't mean the stock market. The price of a share of Apple has no impact at all on a typical person's life. But the price of an actual Apple? Now we're talking about putting food on the table. Economists watch the price of that apple and a whole bunch of other stuff we buy to see if the cost of living goes up. That's inflation, and it means every dollar you have is worth a little less. Normally, we expect a little inflation over a long period of time. When Gramps tells you, I remember when going to the pictures used to cost 50 cents, he's not making it up. One dollar really did buy two movie tickets back in the 1950s. Today, it's closer to 20 bucks. But what if? in just the next year or so, your 50 cent apple cost more. Not just double, keep on going. What if the dollar became so worthless you needed thousands, even half a million bucks to buy an apple? That's hyperinflation. It's not make-believe, it's happening right now in Venezuela. While US inflation's been running less than 2%, Venezuela's is 10 million percent by some estimates. The Venezuelan boulevard is so worthless, people throw stacks of money in the streets to protest. Hyperinflation is a vicious cycle. Everyone expects prices to keep going up, so they try to buy things before that happens. More demand, less supply, higher prices. This is why it's called runaway inflation. You won't find many economists who expect Venezuela level inflation in the US, but some worry inflation could get pretty bad because the government's printing more money in the pandemic. Print enough, the theory goes, you'll water down the value of a dollar and set off inflation. Other economists predict the opposite. 
deflation, lower prices, which can happen on its own in a down economy when people tend to buy less and save more. If people see prices fall and believe they'll keep falling, they don't buy things, they wait. That's stagflation, a big slowdown of the economy that can destroy jobs. The Federal Reserve has tools it can use to try to keep inflation around that nice smooth 2%. Still, a lot of economics is just theory. We can't tell you for certain where the value of your money will go, but now you know what the experts are watching for on the horizon. And as expected, those few showers that we've been tracking out there for you tonight are can continuing to fall apart where we see nothing going on here in Atlanta. The showers over in West Georgia already fell apart. This one that popped up in Walton County as that's been drifting on over to the uh, west. It has fallen apart now. It's now not even visible on here anymore. And the showers up in North Georgia, they're also falling apart. Still a little bit of that light rain right there in the northern parts of White County, southern parts of Towns County. Uh, so looking pretty good out there for the rest of the nighttime hours. And we don't expect any additional showers to develop tonight. So it should be okay to sleep tonight without worrying about any thunder or lightning or anything outside on your roof. Summertime pattern, yeah, it's here. It's been warm. You know, today's high was uh, 89 degrees, and that's right where we should be for this time of year. Tomorrow and for the next couple of days, we're going to be in the lower 90s, and we have some humidity around that mixes in with that heat and with that together that bubbles up some afternoon pop up showers and we're going to see that over the next few days, but it's just that afternoon and evening variety and not everybody gets hit by those. In fact, the rain chance tomorrow is going to be at about 30% and on Saturday also a 30% chance for showers. Now I mentioned that high today, 89 degrees right where we should be for this time of year. Yep, this is the average high for uh, today's date 89 and we hit 89. Same thing for the low. The average low for this time of year is 71. And this morning we hit 71. So this was exactly where temperatures are normally supposed to be here for uh, the second day of July. Now we did get some rain that came through Hartsfield late afternoon. It was a quick moving shower dumped about 16 hundredths of an inch of rain here. That gives us a surplus just under 13 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. And then that also cooled us off a little bit, but then the temperature started rising again. In fact, you can kind of see here where the rain came in. Now we started off this morning mild. It was dry for the first part of the day. We warmed up. I know this shows 88, but it hit 89 today in between these hourlies. And then at three o'clock it was 87. But then look what happens when the, that little bit of rain came by Hartsfield Jackson. The temperatures fell to 79 and then it went moved through so quickly. The sun came out again and we warmed back up to 84 by seven o'clock. So little ups and downs in those temperatures out there tonight. Right now we're still in the 80s at 81 degrees. We do have some 70s in some spots like in Carrollton, Peachtree City, Covington, Thomaston, LaGrange on the north side. More of those 70s around too. still some 80s though in Rome, Gainesville and also into Athens. We will We'll see these temperatures falling into the 70s and by tomorrow morning it's going to be another mild start in the lower 70s but dry weather overnight dry for the first part of the day tomorrow and I really think most of us will stay dry for a big part of the afternoon. Just be prepared for a couple of those pop up showers that will develop and the rain chances at 30%. It's pretty much going to be the same thing for Saturday and Sunday as well. Highs in the lower 90s, a 30% chance for some of those afternoon pop up showers. We do see the rain chances coming up a little bit more for a Monday. Also Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday with a 40 to 50% chance for showers and that'll help bring those temperatures back down into the 80s. It's still weird to think no race on uh, on the 4th of July. It's, it's weird to see these newscasts that don't have any stories on the race itself. You know, it's very odd. I guess we're all used to it by now. I'm not. Three Georgia Tech athletes and three members of the athletic department staff have tested positive for COVID-19. The athletes tested positive in the initial screening fray, uh, phase, so they were able to be separated before they began voluntary workouts with teammates. Now, these are the first known positive tests within Georgia Tech's athletics department. Yeah, ready to go. Ready for tomorrow? Of course I'm ready. Are you ready for tomorrow? Hell yeah. They are the familiar faces, the guys of summer, indeed. The Braves' first team workout set for tomorrow. First time in four months, they will get it going. And as we get ready for the season, Alex Glaze caught up with former Brave Peter Moylan, who is now an analyst for Fox Sports South. Baseball is back. Um, but the big question for you, I'll ask you as a, as a former player, four months off. Right and you're getting kind of thrown back into this thing. What's the mindset and how do you get right 
and you got to get right quickly. This has been an extended six, eight month off season. Um, there are going to be a handful of guys that have looked at this and gone, you know what, I'm just going to take an extended break and not do a lot. There are other guys that are the younger guys or guys fighting for spots that might have used this time to get a whole lot better. The difference is going to be the people that decided to use this time to get better are the ones you're going to really see have improvements this year and even next year. Do you think this can work? I think people are, are really skeptical about these leagues starting back up. I think it can work, um, only because I've seen it happen in Korea. Safety is the number one issue, will be for the whole year. And I just think that you know, if there's a case or if there's a team that happens to get a few cases, I just don't know what's going to happen then. This was supposed to be the Braves' year. Right. So let's say everything plays out perfectly. The Braves win the World Series. Does this one have an asterisk next to it? Does this count? No. It, this, it would be the most Atlanta thing ever for them to win this year. <laughs> right? It, it would be. It's so true. Atlanta fans are probably thinking this is our year because just because of that fact. If, it, if Atlanta's ever going to win one, it's going to be this year because it's so strange. But, yeah, I, it still counts. It's still going to matter. It's the, Guys, everybody's under the same sort of... Hold on, you're saying it, it counts? Thing. They are, absolutely, every team is fine for the same thing. All right, the GHSA reportedly plans to ease restrictions beginning on Monday. Sports teams can engage in more competitive one-on-one -on -one drills. For football, that means intra-squad seven-on-seven competitions. GHSA Executive Director Dr. Robin Hines met with his Sports Medicine Advisory Council, which endorsed this decision. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. You. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on... 
It's going to be another typical summertime day tomorrow with dry conditions. The first part of the day, we warm up to 91 in the afternoon and with the heat and humidity. We'll see a few pop up showers developing rain chance at 30% Friday and Saturday Sunday as well with those high temperatures holding in the lower 90s. So when you see those thunder shower symbols and the raindrops for the holiday weekend, it's not going to rain all day. In fact, some of you will make it through the day with no rain at all. We're just talking about some of those afternoon pop ups, but next week the rain chance comes up a little bit to 40% Monday, 50% chance Tuesday and Wednesday back to 40% on Thursday and with the additional clouds and a little better chance for some rain around that's going to help those temperatures bump back down into the 80s for next week. All right, well, it's looking good for the week, <laughs> looking good for the weekend rather. Natisha, how are you doing? Good. I'm doing well. <laughs> All right, have a good night. <laughs> good night, everybody. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more 